Hello again, and welcome to the Faith Church YouTube channel as we continue studying through the book of Ezekiel. I want to ask, what do you long for? What comes to mind when you think about your longings, your desires? Is it maybe to have a loan paid off? Is it some kind of financial stability, security, maybe to be financially independent? Is it something that money could buy? Uh, maybe a, a home, a car, a certain kind of a possession, a vacation? Or do you long for a certain relationship? It could be a dating relationship or marriage or I hope it's not this, but it is in, in many cases, a broken relationship that you would love to have restored. Um, for many people, longing is about their physical body and, and healing from some kind of a sickness or a disease. Maybe just simply freedom from pain. Could be related to your job, a career, or wanting success, wanting a raise, wanting some kind of forward motion. Maybe you don't feel fulfilled. Um, it, it could be many things. We have all kinds of longings and desires in life, from the big ones like world peace down to the small ones like a longing for a particular dessert. Longing and desire is a normal part of life. God created us with longings, and that means he, he created our desires. So they're, they're not wrong. They're actually neutral. The problem is that while desire can actually be good, it, it can push us to achieve things, to study new areas, scientific discoveries, to mend what is broken, to restore. Desire can also be bad. In fact, if you think about it, nearly every bad thing that people have done throughout history, whether it's the, the tiniest white lie or a massive crime like genocide, probably finds its roots in some sort of evil desire. So turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 14, and, and there we're going to meet some people who have longings and desires. In the very first verse, we read that some of the elders of Israel came to me in Ezekiel's writing here and sat down in front of me. Now, this is the second time that the elders have visited Ezekiel. The first was in chapter 8, uh, right before Ezekiel had this grand vision where God transported him in the vision to Jerusalem. Well, now they're back. It really seems that even though Ezekiel had this unique and sometimes bizarre prophetic ministry where it, I mean, at least to me, it seems like people would have looked at him with suspicion or concern even. Is he out of his mind? That there was still this idea that Ezekiel was a prophet of God. And so people would come to him, like these elders, to sit in front of him and ask, what does God have to say? Well, what will God say to the elders? Let's keep reading in verses 2 and 3. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. These men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Isn't that fascinating? Two major concerns God has with these people. First, they put idols in their hearts and they were, whatever he means by practicing some sort of wickedness that led to stumbling and it was right in front of them. What does God mean by all of this? Uh, we're going to spend most of our time talking about that first one. Idols that they set up in their hearts. We have heard a lot about idolatry in the book of Ezekiel so far. There were idols in the high places on the mountains of Israel. There were idols in the temples in Jerusalem. These idols were, in a very literal sense, made of wood and stone and metal. They were figurines that were to look like pagan gods. Well, what then is an idol in the heart that he mentions here in verse 3? And we're not talking about putting little tiny idol action figures inside a heart. We're not talking about uh, any kind of open heart surgery here. Instead, the word heart here refers to a person's inner being. 
It's the source of emotion and feeling. It's the source of will. It's oftentimes referred to just simply as mind. Um, God is saying that these elders have allowed idolatry to take root in their inner being. They are longing after something. They have desires, and that desire is not God. It's an idol. It could be a false idea. It could be uh, a false god, for sure. But there, there's this longing that has become an idol. Now, you have to think about this in terms of the ancient world. The gods were conceived to be the source of protection. They promoted healing, uh, fertility, wealth, blessing, prosperity. And so you would pay tribute to the gods. You would make sacrifices to the gods when you needed something. So it could be that you're looking at your crops. They're not doing well. The rains haven't come. What do you do? You go to the temple and sacrifice. Or maybe you are childless and you desperately want a baby. You go and make a sacrifice. Or maybe you see in the distance your enemy is attacking you. You go to the temple and you pray for the blessing of your God. And so the result is that these false gods were seen as having power. And the people would grow within their hearts a desire to acquire that power, to acquire that blessing and protection. So in this sense, idolatry of the heart is very much similar to what we would consider lust. When we lust, we desire that which is not ours. That thing could be another person, could be a possession, uh, it could be a version of ourselves even, a new job, um, an, an image online. If we let it, that desire can become idolatry, like a god that we worship. Have you ever had that happen to you? Kind of know what I mean? Have you experienced that within yourself? If it's a person, maybe it's someone you long for. You daydream about them. You think about them. You actually you find that you can't stop thinking about them. It's a lot like greed. Could be a new house. It could be a new car. You want it so badly. You're thinking that if you get it, it'll make your life so much better. It's the belief that money will take care of us. Or it could be put this way, that if you have the right training, uh, maybe the right education, that will open the door for you to have the right job, and that will lead to the right kinds of health insurances, and especially salary. And that will lead to the right possessions and the home and the investments and retirement and travel and you put it all together and we call it the good life behind it all is desire a craving for the the new thing or the next thing the better thing so many things in our world promise us that good life could be a politician could be a preacher. And if we believe them, we can grow an idolatry in our hearts to have that. A seeking for answers in the midst of the uncertainty of life and believing that those answers are found in many different places. But the problem is when we don't seek after God. That's idolatry in the heart. Idolatry in the heart is so dangerous because of where it's located the center of our being. It's the, the foundation of our inner life. Now this summer, I had poison ivy twice. I get it so easy. And in both cases, I had to go to the doctor and get prednisone, a steroid, to help clear it out quicker. I, I, for me, it just goes on and on and on. It'll eventually clear up, but it can take a long time. And you know what? If I never got those steroids, I would be okay. It would just be a pain, itchy, but it's on the outside. It, it's on my skin. I know that I would be okay. That's very different than if I had heart disease or cancer or organ failure. Those are in the inner part 
of my life affecting the vital organs. And you can't just say, oh, I'll let it run its course. You have to take drastic action and attention and get them cared for or else almost certainly you will die. If we don't take action to deal with idolatry in the heart, we will also die spiritually. Now God takes action. Look at how he takes action. Go back to verse 3 because there is one more thing we need to consider before we see the action that God takes place. It's the, the second part of his concern. The first was idolatry in the heart. The second is what he calls, they have put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. And what does that mean? Literally, he's talking about the idea of tripping on something and it makes you fall down. So the first concern that he had, this idolatry in the heart, was a concern for their inner being. It was all about their desire. Now he draws attention to what is outside them, and that's how they put action to their desire. It could be that they engage in sin with a prostitute. It could be cheating on someone or cheating in a deal. It could be stealing. It could be committing a crime, a murder, a vast many things. So what we see in these two is the first problem is about inner desire. The second problem is acting out that desire. Both lead to sin. Both are evidence of brokenness between ourselves and God. And so at the end of verse 3, God asks Ezekiel, should I even let these people inquire of me? It's almost as if God is saying, these guys are so far gone, Ezekiel. They have chosen to set up idols in their hearts and they're acting on it. And yet, they come to inquire of me? It reminds me, maybe you've had a person in your life that they really hurt you. Maybe they even cheat on you, betray you, and then they choose to barely ever talk to you. But in the moment of their need, what do they do? They're texting, they're on the phone, they're asking for help, they're asking for money. Maybe you know the person. They haven't had anything, like a good relationship with you, for a long time. And suddenly they appear out of the blue, asking for help. How does that make you feel? Probably used. You think maybe God feels like that? I think so. So it seems the question is not, how will he respond to these guys coming inquiring of him? But really, is he even going to allow any response at all? Is he going to just say no? Well, God first reveals that they have idols in their hearts. And then that they put these wicked stumbling blocks in front of them. They commit sin. He has every right to say, no way, I am not talking to you. And yet, look at verse 4. He says this. Therefore, he's talking to Ezekiel. Speak to them and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him myself in keeping with his great idolatry. Basically, God says, guys, when you're acting like that, idolatry in your heart, committing sin, and then you come to me looking for answers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, but it's going to be in line with how you've acted. So you kind of wonder, what does that mean? Is he going to punish them? Is he going to judge them? Uh, or, you know, is he going to just turn his back and give them the silent treatment? Here we go. Look at verse 5. He says in verse 5, I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. Whoa, that's not what I expected. God wants to recapture their hearts. They've all deserted him, and yet there he is still longing for a relationship with them, still inviting them. That's how he answers them. That's what he's talking about when he's saying, I'm going to... I'm going to respond to them in keeping with idolatry. He's basically saying, guys, before we can talk, we have something we need to deal with. And so he's not going to interact with them 
until he has their hearts. He's basically saying that this is a serious issue that needs to be dealt with. He is not at all saying, oh, hey guys, thanks for stopping over at Ezekiel's house, let's talk. They have ventured so far from him. And when they show up, God says, stop before we can even talk. We got to deal with the idolatry in your heart. We got to deal with the sinful acts. That's how he is. It shows his mercy, his grace, and his love, and yet balanced with his concern for righteousness and justice. So, what are they going to have to do? Look at verse 6. He says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, This is what the sovereign Lord says Repent, turn from your idols, and renounce all your detestable practices. That's what they have to do. One word repent. It's a powerful, vibrant word. It's actually in there twice in a row. In verse 6, it's repent and return. It's the same root word. And the first one is an emphatic command. He is saying to them clearly in their face, repent. It means turn around. It's really the image of a person who is going in one direction, the wrong direction, and they turn around and go back in the right way. But that's really the, the very literal sense. I mean, you would literally use that for a person like walking on a road. God is using the word in a, in a theological sense, a spiritual sense, and he's saying to the people, come back to me, return to me, have a restored relationship with me. Now, that second use of the word, he says, repent and return, it includes some very specific detail, details of what he wants. Those idols that they have set up in their hearts, they have to turn away from them. And, and those wicked stumbling block activities, they have to stop doing them. That's what it means to repent and return to him. Now, notice how God describes their relationship in verse 7. He says, when any Israelite or any alien living in Israel separates himself from me and sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet to inquire of me, I, the Lord, will answer him. Myself. He kind of repeats what he's saying here. And, and this is so interesting. Notice the, the idea that he uses. They have separated themselves from him. They chose it. They showed this. They set up the idols in their hearts. They committed the sinful acts in their lives. And so God's indictment is strong. He is saying, you are no longer in relationship with me. Instead, you have willfully chosen to separate yourselves. Now, when we talk about separation in a marriage relationship, that's a powerful word. It, it's serious. It usually means divorce is not far away. And that's why we only rarely advise separation and, and, and only very, very temporarily. But in this case, it's not God who agreed to the separation. It's the people. They chose it. They did it, not God. They walked away from him. Now, when these elders show up, clearly God is saying, you still have the idolatry in your hearts. You're still doing the wicked, sinful actions. That means they haven't repented. They are in that separated state. They are in rebellion. And yet, they have the audacity to show up and ask God for help. They don't really want to be in relationship with him. They just want God to do their bidding. It's really, really selfish on their parts. So imagine being God in this situation. It's, it's why in verse 5 he uses that really striking word to describe how he feels. Go back and look at verse 5, and there he says, You deserted me. Imagine the emotion that God feels. So that's why in verse 7 he basically is saying, So you deserted me, but now you've come to the prophet to inquire of me? Well, guess what? I'm going to answer you myself. That's new. God's saying, I'm bypassing the prophet. Let's talk face to face, me and you. It really kind of sounds intimate and personal, but there is a big problem. The people haven't repented. They're in rebellion. There is no relationship between them and God. And so what that means is God's direct communication, whatever he's going to say to them, they might not want to hear what he has to say. Look at verse 8. He says, 
I will set my face against that man and make him an example and a byword. I will cut him off from my people. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now that should sound familiar if you've been following along with Ezekiel. Remember the prophetic stare from chapter 6, and then we even saw it last week in chapter 13? That's when God told Ezekiel to set his face against the mountains in Israel and the, the false religious practices. And then last week we saw him, set your face against the false prophets. Now God says, he's going to be the one to stare at them. He is shining the light of his truth by setting his face against them. Well, I think it should be pretty obvious. You don't want God to unleash the prophetic stare against you. If Ezekiel was doing it, and, and it seems like he did right there in his village in Babylon, just staring at people, people could say, Ezekiel, what are you doing, weirdo? They're not going to react like that when God does it. Imagine God, the full force of God just staring at you. That's different. He describes it in verse 8 in the sense that when he does this, it will make them an example and a byword. It's kind of a way of saying, like, you're going to become a proverb. And, and it's not going to be a proverb about what to do. It's going to be a proverb about what not to do, a cautionary tale. It's basically saying, don't be like these guys who set up idols in their hearts and commit wicked, sinful acts. And then, worst of all, in verse 8, God says, I will cut you off. That's not what you want to hear. It's almost as if God is saying, you deserted me. You separated yourself from me. I divorce you. You don't want God to say, I divorce you. Divorce is always painful and awful. But when God divorces you, you experience a deep bleakness and despair and aloneness you cannot imagine. But you will know one thing, God says in verse 8. You'll know that he is the Lord. You will know that the idols that you set up in your heart were false. They made empty promises. You will know that God is the one true God. You'll know that your wicked ways were wrong and you should have been following and performing his ways. This is why God says so strongly in verse 6, Repent! Turn away from the false gods. Come back to me. Let me fulfill your desires. God doesn't want this separation. He doesn't want divorce. He wants to be in close relationship with his people. The question is, will they return? Let's continue. Look at verses 9 and 10. He says, And if the prophet is enticed to utter a prophecy, I, the Lord, have enticed that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people, Israel. They will bear their guilt. The prophet will be as guilty as the one who consults him. Then the people of Israel will no longer stray from me, nor will they defile themselves any more with all their sins. They will be my people, and I will be their God, declares the Sovereign Lord. When you read that, it almost sounds like God is saying, I'm going to cause the prophet to prophesy, and then I'm going to punish him to the point of death. I read that, and I think, whoa, that doesn't sound right, does it? It's almost like, God, are you saying that first you're going to take away the prophet's free will, and you're going to make him do something wrong, and then you're going to punish him because he did something wrong. That's not fair. In fact, we would call that evil. So whenever you read scripture and something like that doesn't make sense, uh, or if it makes God out to be evil, something's amiss. It could be that we're not understanding a cultural situation. It could be a mistranslation. It, it could be a misinterpretation as well. We know God's heart is a heart of love. We've heard it already. He wants his people to repent and return to him. He's not a God who plays manipulative games with people. So what's going on here? Now, I actually think there's an explanation. Go back to verse 7, and that's where God first mentions this prophet. There we see God describe a situation. We know the people are in rebellion, and they go to a prophet. 
And God says he will intervene. Uh, he will speak straight to the people himself. He's not going to use the normal method where the prophet is the intermediary. Well, now in verse 9, God continues describing this whole situation. So, God has already spoken to the people directly. What if, after God has already himself spoken directly to his people, the prophet also speaks? It seems that God is describing a prophet who is arrogant or power-hungry. Um, God's already dealt with the situation. There is no need for the prophet to speak, and yet he still speaks. It's really bold, right? It reminds me of seminary classes where students would, would disagree with the professor. And, and almost they would start lecturing right there, sitting in their seats, as if they were teaching the class. And I'd be thinking in my head, please be quiet. I am not paying all this money for these classes to listen to you. I want to hear the professor. In like manner, the prophet speaks up after God has already spoken. I mean, what more could the prophet add? Nothing. God's handled it perfectly well. So the prophet should be quiet, but he's not quiet. He can't keep his mouth shut, and he speaks. Now, I know, in verse 9, it says God enticed him. I don't believe that that means God is saying, I am overriding that person's free will, and I'm going to make them speak something wrong. Instead, it seems best to understand, as the prophet there, hearing God talk, but also very eager to add in his two cents. You know how you get into a discussion sometimes and people are sharing all their various stories and you think of one and it's the ultimate story that's a part of the discussion. It relates. It's funny. People are going to laugh. They're going to look at you and think, oh man, that was awesome. And so, you are chomping at the bit to get your story in. You want to be the star of the conversation. Everyone will think you're hilarious, knowledgeable, and wise. I think something like that's going on here. I could be wrong, but it seems that God is describing a prophet who should have kept his mouth shut. God already handled it. And of course God handled it. God is... God, it, 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 he knows how to handle the situation. So why in the world would the prophet think that he has anything at all to add after God has already spoken? Well, you and I both know, sometimes we get tempted like that. Sometimes people have a personality where they can't stop talking, where they're know-it-alls, or um, just that temptation to get your voice heard in a discussion is so enticing. And we give in to the temptation, and we just let it fly. Well, rather than becoming the star of the discussion, God says to the prophet, you're done. And notice the drastic shift that happened there in verse 11. After God places the guilt on the prophet, the people no longer stray from God. They no longer commit sin. They have returned to God. They will be his people and he will be their God. It's a picture of the repentance and the renewal that God so desires. Repentance leads to renewal. Hold that thought. Think about that phrase and remember it as we work through the rest of the chapter. We're going to move through it fairly quickly. Because I think that we're going to come back around to the idea that repentance leads to renewal. Look at verse 12. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply, and send famine upon it, and kill its men and their animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. Or if I send wild beasts through that country, then jump ahead to verse 17. He talks about the sword. Verse 19, he talks about the plague, and he repeats the situation over and over again that only uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job will save their lives by their righteousness. And then he concludes in verse 21, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, how much worse will it be when I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plague, to kill its men, 
and their animals. Yet there will be some survivors, sons and daughters, who will be brought out of it. They will come to you, and when you see their conduct and their actions, you will be consoled regarding the disaster I have brought upon Jerusalem, every disaster I have brought upon it. You will be consoled when you see their conduct and their actions, for you will know that I have done nothing in it without cause, declares the Sovereign Lord. So we have these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. First of all, the famous Noah of Noah and the Ark. The story is in the book of Genesis. And then the famous Job. He has his own book of the Bible. But Daniel, we're not quite sure who he is. There's a lot of scholarly disagreement. The Daniel, for whom the book of the Bible, Daniel's name, actually was a contemporary of Ezekiel and would have been in Babylon probably at the same time Ezekiel was as a part of that exile. So it could be that it's talking about that Daniel. He might have become famous in Babylon by this point, and we, we just don't know for sure. This point, though, is not about these three men. The point is about how they reacted in the situation that God describes. It's a pattern. He repeats it four times over. God is saying, if he sends disastrous judgment to a nation because they have been sinful and unfaithful, even if those three men were alive, They'd only be able to save themselves. The rest of the nation would face judgment. And God is saying, this is going to happen to Jerusalem for dreadful judgments, and it will be awful. But notice verse 22. There will be a remnant, he says. There will be another exile, and they will come to Babylon just like Ezekiel and the 10,000 Jews did six and a half years before. And this is where it gets interesting. Ezekiel and the 10,000 that are with him there already in Babylon, they're going to be watching as these newbies arrive. They're going to be observing their behavior. They're going to be shocked by how wicked their conduct will be. And that will tell Ezekiel and the exiles that had already been there for six and a half years all they need to know about why God allowed this to happen. Basically, they'll say, God's judgment wasn't random. It's not uh, unjust. Instead, it's a response to the fact that the people had set up idols in their hearts and committed acts of wickedness. And so the focus of this chapter is not on God's judgment. It's on his invitation to repentance. God is separated from his people, and he's not at all happy about that. They chose to leave him. And now he invites them to return. God is passionate about being in a real loving relationship with his people. And so as we think about this as it relates to our lives, have you allowed any desire to captivate your heart that is not in line with God's heart? Ezekiel chapter 14 is a clarion call for us to examine our hearts. What do you desire is God your desire? Better yet, how does your desire for a vibrant relationship with God stack up against your other desire? For example, I can eagerly desire to be done with my dissertation and beyond that, to have the dissertation get picked up and published and for it to make the New York Times bestseller list and on and on I could go. But do I desire God like that? Is God the focus of our desire? It's why we so often talk about transformation. So that our desires, when we all have desires, but that they are being transformed to be in line with God's heart. Do your desires match up with God's desires? That's why Paul would go on to describe in Galatians chapter 5 this idea of walking in step with the Holy Spirit. The problem is so often we're not in step. Our desires are often different from God's desires. Could be in small little ways, could be in big ways. We live in a world that feeds into our desires. And, and often it's not because the world cares about us. I mean, think about how businesses market to us. They advertise to us. They're trying to tap into our desires. Is it because they care about us and want the best for us? They might say that, 
But what they really want is for us to buy their products, to spend our money, to enrich them. They say that their products are going to change our lives and give us the good life, but the reality is they want our money. They probably want our money more than they have our best interest in mind. God, however, has our best interest in mind, period. When he told the Jews in Ezekiel's day that they should repent and return to him, it was because that was the best possible situation for them. They would be far better off in a vibrant relationship with God than if they continued down this pathway of setting up idols in their hearts and committing wicked, sinful acts. God is trying to give them a, a vision for a better reality, a world where the true good life is his life for them. And so I ask, what idols have you set up in your hearts? More than likely, those idols promise you the good life, but it's not true. In Ezekiel 14, we have this important reminder to examine our hearts, our desires, evaluate if they are aligned with God's heart and desires. And that can require some vulnerable work on our part. Sometimes it's hard work. It could be very uncomfortable work. It can require people in our lives who speak honestly to us, asking us tough questions about our heart's desires. And perhaps the, the best thing for us to do is to, to have our lives placed under that kind of examination to see, to, to reveal to us if in fact we have godly desire or not. And if we do, then we should do what God says to the people in Ezekiel 14, repent return to him restore relationship with him let's set that bar high in our lives to return to god and have him be our ultimate desire lord we thank you for this reminder it can be so hard to know what that actually looks like to repent and return to you it can be hard even to put ourselves in that vulnerable place of having our desires evaluated by you and for you. But Lord, I pray, I pray that we would be willing to trust you, to, to believe that you actually do have our best interests in mind, to enter into that kind of restored, renewed relationship with you, and to say no to setting up any kind of idol in our heart based on selfish or evil desire. Lord, help us to understand what it means to, to fully return to you and how to actually do that in our, our real world of home and work and, and life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us again today. As always, if you'd like to learn more about Faith Church, you can visit our website, findfaithhere.org. Please feel free to comment below, and we would be glad to be in conversation with you. Thank you.